Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to go really, really fast and cover a, a bunch of material. And as I was thrown out this bone of technology, I was asked, okay, what does technology mean to me? And what's it going to happen in the future? What are the impacts associated with it? Well, f for me, one of the greatest things uh, that inspire me the most is, is living systems and, and what living systems are able to do. I'd like to be able to do some really incredible things. I'd like to be able to engineer my own living system. I'd like to be able to take systems that I build and engineer and impart the same sort of properties that we find in, 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 in living systems that we all are surrounded by on an everyday basis. The level of sophistication that we find in living systems is far beyond anything that we've built or engineered. So my quest has been figuring out how can I build things like that. It began a while ago in which I decided, well, maybe I can make small robots. Mimicking that little device you saw there, can I make something that's really small that can self-assemble and integrate? So I developed a polymer that gets hard when you heat it up. I, fig I figured out some techniques for, for making cardiac stem cells grow and then to mature so they become adult cells. I figured out how to make these cells go and form connections. And the idea was I was going to have this, this melting pot where I put the raw materials in. It was all going to self-assemble and you end up having some device like you see right here, and, and, and it would come alive. It would be something which I took the rudimentary parts of, of engineered systems and make it come alive. Well, we worked on it for a while, and there's a lot of technical issues associated with it, but ultimately, we were successful in, as you can see, in, uh, in building devices that are smaller than anything that's found in nature. The head to tail length of that's about 100 microns to size, about the diameter of your hair. And there is no other system in, uh, in, in living systems that have muscle, organized muscle groups that are this small. But now this isn't quite enough. If you take a look at what real living systems do, is you can see that you have, this here is a, uh, a neutrophil. It's chasing after uh, a, a bad bug. And you see it's, it's, it's going around. It's, it's making decisions. It goes to the right. It goes to the left. It's, it, ultimately, it's going to consume this bug and it's going to eat it. And, what you find here, and what was most intriguing to me, is that you have environmental awareness without a brain. All right? Through the information that's being passed along between, between individual molecules, decisions are being made that transcend the, the defined chemical reactions that we all work with. I was, I was uh, pondering this and saying, now what is the difference between what we build and how life works? And what you find out is that during the agricultural mechanical age, we build everything from six simple machines, levers and screws and whatever, everything from a Babbage computer to a plow, all come from the same simple machines. In the electronics age, we have five fundamental components. And everything we build comes from the five fundamental components. Everything from, from satellites to my watch all comes from these five fundamental components. Living systems have tens of thousands of components. These components people would normally refer to as, as chemicals or proteins, but what they do functions. And if you look at them as individual functions, it becomes the ability then, can I take these functions and engineer them into systems you want to build? We have pumps, transducers, valves, we have all sorts of different things. But the issue is how do I make them available for us to build and engineer? Well, the journey began when I figured out how to take a, a molecule called ATP synthase, stick it on a little, uh, a single molecule onto a post, put a, a, a nanoscopic rod on top of it, and make the thorn thing spin, make it switch, make it turn around. And I was able to be able to take single molecules and assemble them in positions where I wanted to. But single molecules and putting these systems together, like building a watch, is not the way living systems work. What you find out is, and this, this is one of the most, for me, one of the moments of epiphany. I was at Albert Einstein Medical School giving a talk, and I was visiting Rob Singer during that period of time. And Rob was studying the reproductive behavior of yeast. Well, those of you who aren't up on your reproductive behavior of yeast, a yeast, cell, a yeast cell can bud, all right? And only a female cell can bud. But the genetic content of the bud itself can be either, can be either male or female, but the genes are all the same. The difference between whether it's a girl or a boy is totally dependent upon the expression of the individual protein. So if the female cell is going is to bud and produce a male and produces that protein during the process, she becomes a he. It's all over. All right? We all can understand why. All right? and, but, but so how does nature get around it? What you find is that it lays down railroad tracks of microtubules from the, from the 
the uh, mother to the future son. And, and then there's a, a group of seven molecules that carry the messenger RNA where it gets expressed down to the son, the, to the new son. What happens is through stochastic interactions of seven different molecules, collectively, they determine the sex of that, of that, of that organism. And if I showed you the, those molecules, and I said, these are the behavior of those molecules, tell you what they do. Now, one, nobody would guess what they do. That's the level of emergent functionality which differentiates things between we engineer and the way life really works. You know, and if you can do something like that, you say, well, how does this really work? Of course, engineers, we put together a model, and we start thinking about this, is it valid? And so I'm going through this, and I find a piece of work that was done in Japan with physerium slime mold. Now, I won't bore you with, with physerium slime mold, but trust me to say that you're able to make it solve a maze. It's able to go and solve a maze, and I've replicated it a number of times in my laboratory. It solves a maze. It does math. You find out that groups of populations of individuals, like ants and termites, act sophisticated ways, build termite mounds. And then you find out that people do the same darn thing when we're stuck on that 75, right? When we're stuck on this 75, we go right, we go left, we go all over the place, right? And it looks like we're all disorganized. We're all working with nearest neighbor information, operating on rules of optimization between interacting with individuals. But the fact is, if you fly over in a helicopter, the traffic looks like it's organized and orderly as it's flowing around a mattress burning in the carpool lane. But you know darn well it's not organized and orderly. It's a, it's a different perspective. What happens is, is I believe you start out at levels of supermolecular systems going up in scale. And at each scale, you have a scale of observation. And at that scale of observation, new properties emerge, new functionality comes out, which you can't predict within the confines of that scale. And they result as, it results as an order of, of stochastic nonlinear interactions. We can't go through all the rules associated with it, but trust me to say that I start looking at this and says, well, how can I make complex systems now that have the same sort of level of interaction? I went back and I looked at a cell, and contrary to popular belief, it's not a sack with a bunch of chemicals in there. It's organized and ordered. And the reason why it's organized and orderly is because it allows the cell to do nanotechnology by having membranes. That's what membranes do. Membranes control diffusion, they control, they control, they enable local compartmentalization, and they allow those molecules to do what you want it to do. Basically, those, those membranes control the flow of energy, uh, matter, and information. So, from that, I said, well, how can I make those, those, those building blocks I showed you earlier and make them available for an engineered system so they don't fall apart? So what we did was we developed a polymer that, under, that has, is liquid in the center, has the same structure as a biological membrane, and allows me to place transmembrane proteins across this polymer and have this be stable over wide temperature regime, regimes and for long periods of time. I make this polymer into little vesicles, and the end result is it makes small organelles. Organelles are the order of scale of 40 to 150, 200 nanometers in diameter. And these organelles now provide a function, a closed function like you would find within one compartment within the cell. So once you make that, you say, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing, if you're going to make a complex system at this scale, you need to get energy into the system. So we started looking at how we can get energy, and we built a device you see here. This device has bacteriodopsin and ATP synthase. What you have is a pump, bacteriodopsin, and ATP synthase, which is a proton turbine that, that uses mechanical energy to produce the energy of life, ATP. So the way it works is a, a photon of light whacks one of the bacteriodopsins. It pumps a proton inside the center of the, of the sphere, and the proton head builds up. The head uh, spins the turbine, which causes that shaft to spin, which I showed you in the first slide, that little shaft spinning, that little rod. That shaft causes mechanical deformation and makes ATP. So we're able to synthesize something using this process at very, very high levels of efficiency. So I can make energy now. So the question is now, can I make a more complex system? So the idea was, well, can we replicate the Calvin cycle? This is where you take light energy in plants and we convert it over to more complex carbons. But to do that, I have to make a system that deals with 11 different proteins. Really, really complex system. And I have to get that local compartmentalization. I have to be able to self-assemble a system that allows micro to allow the kinetics for the reactions to occur rapidly enough. To do that, we develop a, a, a foam strategy of where if you look at a bubble, you'll see the bubble has a thin water layer which self-assembles. Our little vesicles would fit very, very nicely inside there. So what we did was we incorporate those vesicles inside this, the structure of this foam, and then we do all of our chemistry inside there. 
And the end result is that we end up making a system that which we, do, we replicate the entire process of photosynthesis inside a, a engineer system of foam. All the complexity you see in a plant. But the one big difference is that we get extraordinary efficiencies. We get extraordinary efficiencies because all I'm doing is directing 100% of the energy to the product that we want. I don't have to support the metabolism of the living organism. I don't have to make it grow. I don't have to have it reproduce. And so you end up having a, an opportunity for making energy systems that are much more efficient than things that we normally see. So the next step is, well, can I try and do something more complicated than that? So now I'm, I'm getting more complicated systems here. Can I make excitable vesicles, vesicles which would stimulate each other? And you start thinking about it, well, of course I can. I can go and take the different proteins, stick them inside our membrane system, with the idea being that if I put them in right, I can get them to self-excite one another. If I get them to self-excite one another, in electrical engineering terms, that's called a monostable multivibrator. In biological terms, that's called a, an atrial ventricle node. It's the, it's the AV node. It's a, it's a little part of, of group of cells in your heart that tells your heart to beat. It's the group of cells in your heart that gets sick when you need a pacemaker. And so the idea is, can I make a material now which replaces the lost functionality that you found inside your heart from that group of cells with something that mimics the same exact behavior? So if you can do that, then you say, well, can I make an action potential with this system? Well, the answer is, well, if I change out those, those pieces, I get different behaviors, and I can generate an action potential. And the end result is then, well, maybe I can make materials now that engage in processes that, that allow me to be neural supportive, bridging neurons, or, or, or possibly even, dare we say it, transmit information. And if we're able to do that, then you start thinking about, well, how would that work? If you look at the way the mind works, it takes information and it does three primary logic operations. It does a fuzzy and, a fuzzy or, a fuzzy many are approximately equal to. A fuzzy many approximately equal to is like when you're 16 years old hanging out at 7-Eleven with your buddies and you're all thinking what you want to do on a Friday night and Joe and Pete all want to go to the movies and, and, and Jim says, no, nah, I'm going to stay here. That's what fuzzy many approximately equal to. And so if you take a look at those vesicles, though, you find that if I change the size of those vesicles, a number of magical things happen. One, I change the coordination number. I change how many they're talking to. Two, I change the, re I change the, the strength of the charge that they release, and I change the recovery time. When you have millions of these collectively, you end up with the same logic operations. So what we've done is we've taken those channel proteins, we've incorporated them to our vesicles, we've made them work, we've been able to take these groups of vesicles, combine them together, and we're able to make them talk to one another. So we're able to make them communicate to one another. So the last thing we have to do is we have to incorporate another molecule, which is, a, a, uh, which is an ATPase pump, to recharge the vesicles to get, them, to get it working. But when that happens, you know, we have the opportunity then, maybe in the future, very near future, to make a, a, a information processing unit that processes information that's analogous to the way living systems process information that you find inside your brain. So overall, what you've shown here at the very, very end is that we're able to metabolize materials, we're able to integrate power, make amplified sensing, do all the products, projects that you would normally see and attributes you'd normally see within living systems. Intrinsic properties of something that you build and engineer. We're engineering life into the materials. Hasn't anything else, I've always been blessed by a number of really smart students. This is an older picture, it's from when I was at left, left, first left UCLA. There's actually a faculty member here, David Wendell, who's not here, who contributed a lot, and Hill Chuck Choi, who's a, a research professor. But they've all contributed very heavily to this work, because I couldn't do it myself, that's for sure. Anyway, that was it, right on time. There you go.